Hey Swarmers, welcome back to The Hive. Today, we're talking about O3, or trioxygen, better known to all of us as ozone. 90% of the total ozone in our atmosphere is located in the stratosphere and makes up what we call the ozone layer. This thin section of the Earth's atmosphere absorbs almost all of the sun's harmful ultraviolet light and keeps us delicate little humans from becoming crispy little critters. A few weeks ago, in the midst of rising coronavirus cases worldwide, political upheaval, extreme weather events in the form of back-to-back -back hurricanes in the northern hemisphere and typhoons in the southern, and ongoing fires in the American West, Mario Molina, a chemist whose work on the ozone layer earned him a Nobel Prize in 1995, quietly passed away in Mexico City. He was 77. Molina's work was crucial to enacting the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer in 1987, and it made him one of the most consequential scientists of the past 50 years. First of all, the medal was particularly rewarding because it's not just for my work as a scientist, but for the impact that it has had on uh, society the benefit of society. We hope my work really started as a scientist and then worrying about uh, environmental problems uh, caused by human activities. We decided to ask a question about some chemicals that were just being released to the environment and we realized that they could pose a serious uh, global environmental problem. At the beginning it was just a hypothesis but the science was sound and we were able to work with the scientific community and to really pin down the science to, to a very good degree. But what was perhaps a, a step further was not just to stop at the science itself, but to communicate this to society and then to try to do something about it. So we were fortunate also to uh, work, be able to work with colleagues, even diplomats and so on, so that the uh, it all led to an international agreement. You probably know about the holes that have occurred in the ozone layer over the years over both the North and the South Poles. And you maybe vaguely remember something about the high hair in the 1980s and mass volumes of hairspray being one of the culprits? Hold here, Lord. Hold here strong with bold hold. Bold hold. It's the ultimate with power hold. It's wild. Maximum hold for maximum style. Hold here, Lord. Hold here strong with bold hold. Bold hold. Well, the first thing to mention is that the holes in the ozone layer aren't exactly holes. They are actually a thinning of the ozone in a particular area. The thickness of the ozone layer naturally varies worldwide. It's generally thinner near the equator and thicker near the poles. Thickness refers to how much ozone is in a column over a given area. It varies seasonally due to atmospheric circulation patterns and solar intensity. The first scientific paper on unanticipated and large decreases in ozone concentrations over the Antarctic stations of Halley and Faraday was published in 1985 by Joe Farman, Ryan Gardner, and Jonathan Shanklin. Interestingly, Mario Molina and American scientist Frank Sherwood Rowland published a paper 11 years prior, in 1974, that found chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, chemicals used in a variety of products, were destroying the ozone layer. Remember that hairspray we mentioned earlier? CFCs are any of a class of compounds of carbon, hydrogen, chlorine, and fluorine, typically gases used in refrigerants and aerosol propellants. They are harmful to the ozone layer in the Earth's atmosphere, owing to the release of chlorine atoms on exposure to ultraviolet radiation. This groundbreaking study was lambasted and largely ignored by the chemicals industry, but it ultimately opened the public's eyes to the harmful effects of CFCs and led directly to the Montreal Protocol. What's the big deal if there are already natural fluctuations in the thickness of the ozone layer? Well, remember that the ozone layer prevents most harmful wavelengths of ultraviolet or UV light from passing through the Earth's atmosphere. These wavelengths cause skin cancer, sunburn, permanent blindness, and cataracts, as well as harm plants and animals. 
Since the unexpected and unexpectedly large decreases in ozone in the last century were found to be caused by human-made chemicals, fluctuations are anything but natural. On September 16, 1987, 197 countries, every member of the UN, signed the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer. This treaty sits under the Vienna Convention for Protection of the Ozone Layer and orchestrated the binding, well-planned, and monitored phasing out of all chemicals which are ozone-depleting, like CFCs, halons, and less damaging transitional chemicals, such as hydrochlorofluorocarbons, HCFCs. The protocol targets 96 ozone-depleting chemicals in thousands of applications across more than 240 industries. The ban came into effect in 1989. Ozone levels stabilized by the mid-1990s and began to recover in the 2000s. In 2019, NASA reported that the ozone hole was the smallest ever since it was first discovered in 1982. And while fluctuations continue, the latest World Meteorological Organization UN Environment Program Scientific Assessment of Ozone Depletion, issued in 2018, concluded that the ozone layer is on the path of recovery and to potential return of the ozone values over Antarctica to pre-1980 levels by 2060. The Montreal Protocol is considered the most successful international environmental agreement to date, and Mario Molina was a constant proponent of it and its transformation through ensuing amendments into a climate treaty. In a New York Times op-ed in 2012, Molina wrote, because these same chemicals that destroy the ozone layer also warm the climate, the Montreal Protocol also has made a tremendous contribution to climate protection. This is a planet-saving treaty, protecting both the ozone layer and the climate system. We here at Swarm want to take a moment to recognize Mario Molina, his work, and his dedication to our planet. Thank you for joining us, Swarmers. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to The Swarm, and we will see you next time.